Well, good morning, everybody. Our theme this year comes from Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. We're walking through uh, the Bible this year, and uh, this week we're in Ecclesiastes. So I want to ask a question. How many people would agree that, um, that righteousness is worth pursuing? Wait, let me look. Let me look. I see some without their hands up. I'm totally joking. So we all know, right? We know it's good to argue uh, or to pursue righteousness. Uh, righteousness is right uh, thinking, right doing. It's good to pursue that. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes, um, which I could spend the whole time on, but I'm not going to. Ecclesiastes 6, 9 says, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wondering of the desire. I think that's a pretty poor translation, given, uh, the, given the sense of that verse. Let me read that again. Better is the sight of the eyes than the wondering of the desire. Sounds pretty generic. Let me give you the real sense of that verse. It is more in harmony with God to have deep spiritual insight than to walk a righteous life to satisfy the soul. Let me read that again. It is more in harmony with God to have a deep spiritual insight than to walk a righteous life to satisfy the soul. In other words, to satisfy yourself. So often we pursue righteousness because we feel like we need to do it, right? I need to be a righteous person. I need to do this. And then we get into all these New Year's resolutions and all this other stuff, and I'm doing this for me. We had a class this morning. We were talking about this notion that we've bought into this pop psychology notion that forgiveness is for us, not for the person who has sinned. Um, completely opposite of the biblical view of forgiveness. Forgiveness is exactly for the person who sinned and not for us. Righteousness is about being in harmony with God. Better is it for the eyes of your heart to see God clearly is what that verse is saying. Better is it to be in harmony with God and have this deep spiritual insight than to be walking a righteous life you can be a righteous person, and you're doing it to satisfy your own, your own soul. Guess what happens? You're never, ever, 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 ever satisfied. Do you ever see Christians who you just, you're like, gee, you know? Like they're walking around, and, and, and I, say, I say they become schizophrenic. It's schizophrenic, schizophrenic Christianity. Let me read the definition of the medical term of schizophrenia. It's a long-term mental disorder of a type involving a breakdown in the relation between thought, emotion, and behavior. Sounds a little bit biblical if you really break that down, heart, mind, and soul. It's a long-term mental disorder of a type involving a breakdown in the relation between thought, emotion, and behavior leading to a faulty perception inappropriate actions and feelings, withdrawal from reality and personal relationship into fantasy and delusion and a sense of mental fragmentation. Does that English? Christians who walk around and are just insane, literally insane. They're distraught. They're worried about this. They're never happy never happy with, with the way their life is. They're never happy with... They never talk about God. It's always about... What, what they can do to better themselves. What can I do to be a better person? What do I need to do? How do, I, how do I make the next resolution? How do I do this? And we become so bound to righteousness for satisfaction of our own souls that we lose sight of God. I want to begin reading Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I have chapter 12 is what Eric read from, and we're going to go back into that. But Ecclesiastes chapter 2 talks about the vanity of wisdom. Now, keep in mind, Solomon is the one who wrote Ecclesiastes, the wisest man on the face of the planet. He begins in chapter 1, rather, not chapter 2. He begins in chapter 1 by talking about the vanity of wisdom. Isn't that interesting? The wisest man on the planet is saying, wisdom is vain. 
you know what? You can pursue wisdom. You can pursue it. Um, you can seek it out. But it's all just vanity anyway. Listen to it in context. He says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem. And I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Do we ever feel like, do we ever pray that prayer, God, give me wisdom? I just need to know. I just need, I need this wisdom to see the world. Sometimes I pray this prayer, God, allow me to see the world through Jesus' eyes. You want to know a little secret? I don't pray that prayer anymore. It's a terrifying, terrifying prayer. I don't want to see the world through Jesus' lens. I don't want to see everything that he sees. There's a reason why we're human and he's God. There's a very good reason for that. Listen to this. I sought out, I applied my heart to seek out and search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. Wisest man on the planet. He knew a lot about a lot. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. Man, I sought out what was going on in the world. I wanted to know. I had to know what was going on and how the mind thinks and how the heart thinks. And I, I wanted to know. I wanted to search every depth, every nook, every cranny. I wanted to know. I was driven by wisdom. I prayed to God. I sought it out and I received this wisdom. It's an unhappy place to be. It's an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I've seen everything that is done under the sun. And behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. Literally, that can be translated, it's a grazing of the wind. It's a term used for cattle or for sheep. Grazing. You're gra Get that picture in your mind. Grazing wind. You ever try to eat wind? You ever get full? No. It reminds me, my wife and I were talking yesterday about these delicious wafers that Delta has. Oh, my goodness, are they incredible. Um, we flew to Canada, and we were like, how do we get a hold of these? I mean, they're excellent, but they're, they're like the size of, I don't know, that. <laughs> and, you, and you eat it, and it's like the taste of the, 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 the gods. <laughs> you eat it, and you're just like, oh. Oh, I need more. And, and then it's gone, right? It's just this little tiny thing. And you're like, I could have gotten more nourishment from my fingernail. You know what I mean? Like you eat it and you just want more. And this is, this is food. He's talking about grazing on, on wind. You get nothing from it. And he said, look, this is my point. I've seen everything that's done under the sun, good and bad. Solomon saw it all. He says, behold, it is vanity, and it's a striving after wind. You don't need to know everything that's happening under the sun. You don't need to know every intricacy of how people think and how they reason. And, and I get caught up in this, too. I'm like, man, I just need to know how they process. I'm an analytical thinker by, by, just by I'm wired that way. I, like some people see a rock, and they're like, oh, that's a nice rock. I'm like, how many dimples does it have? What's underneath it? What's on this side? Uh, you know, and I'm looking at like every nook and cranny of that rock. It's just I'm an analytical thinker, and I think that's a curse in some ways. He goes on. He's not done. He says, what is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be counted. I think what he's saying is you have all this wisdom, and, and you want to just fix the world, right? I mean, look around at what's going on in the world right now, everywhere. Look at the addiction. Look at the opioid addiction. Look at Look at... Everything is going on in the world, and, and like you drive up, and God bless you guys who live in Johnstown, you drive up to Cambria County, and it's a different world. Gangs have overtaken Johnstown. It's insane the amount of gun crimes and drug crimes 20 miles north of us. And man, if you want to know, if you seek it and you look at and you're looking for this wisdom, you get into this mode where where you're like, man, I need to be right so that, you know, so that I'm not like that. It becomes the guy who Jesus talked about. 
who's off in the corner, and he's like, thank you, God, that you didn't make me like them. And Jesus is like, you need to be looking at the guy who's beating his chest, saying, God, save me, a sinner. We get caught in this righteous mode where we pursue righteousness for ourselves and we seek knowledge and we just crave it and we want to know more. And, and we live in this generation where we've become so schizophrenic and we want, like, we Google everything, right? It's like, how do I, how do I walk straighter? I don't know. Like, we Google everything, right? Like, we have to know all this information that does not matter. We're addicted to it. And it's created this sense of schizophrenia. And so Solomon says, It is more in harmony with God to have deep spiritual insight than to walk a righteous life, to satisfy the soul or satisfy your own soul. You know how you get that deep spiritual insight? I've been talking a lot. I've been talking fast. Here's how you get it. You stop. And you listen to God. We don't do it. We're like, where's the Bible verse that says, you know, I stubbed my toe and I said a curse word and it slipped out. I didn't mean to do it, but man, what does God have to say? Like, we're looking up answers for everything. It don't matter. (laughs) Right? It's better to be in harmony with God, have this deep spiritual insight than to walk a righteous life to satisfy the soul. He's not done in chapter 1. He goes on, he says, I said in my heart, I've acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceived that what is also, uh, I perceived that this also is but a striving after the wind. It's a grazing after the wind. I was great. I was a wind grazer. My question to you is, are you a wind grazer? I can memorize whole blocks of passages in the Bible. This is going to sound awful. So what? If you don't know how to apply it, if you don't know how to listen to God, if you're not in harmony with God, if you're not sitting and listening and caring for broken people, if we're not outside of these walls touching the lives of people whose lives are just shattered, so what if you can recite the whole thing from cover to cover and you never talk to one person about Jesus? So what if you can recite it? I'm not saying it's bad to recite Scripture. I think we should memorize more Scripture. But my point is if that's all you do, he says, you're a wind grazer. For much wisdom is much vexation. It's much turmoil, much trouble. For much wisdom is much trouble. And he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. That's interesting, isn't it? As Christians, we get rabid about knowledge. We need to know more. We need to know more. And we cover ourselves in, in, in books and in literature and materials, and we have Bible study after Bible study, and we're constantly wanting to, to learn and to grow. And none of that is bad, but what Solomon's saying is, man, if that becomes your God, if, if you lose harmony with God, if you lose that connection with God, if you stop listening to God, man, it becomes this heavy burden because you know too much about too many people and too many things, and boy, is that a dark place. chapter 12, what Eric read. Remember also your creator. In the days of your youth, this is interesting, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Let me ask you this question. How many of you, it's interesting, isn't it? We're young and we're like, man, I can't wait to be older and I want to be, you know, I want to grow up and I want to drive a car and I want to go to college and we're always wanting to get older and then we get older and we're what? I long for the days of my youth. I don't want, I don't want the responsibilities of this job. Um, having kids, man, it was like, right? Girls used to dress up Barbie dolls in their, in their, in their bride outfit and this flowing gown and they're like, oh, I can't wait to get married. And then they get married and they're like, 
okay. <laughs> and then what, right? Like, and then you get pregnant and curse your husband and, you know, like, and on and on it goes. You have kids and like you used to daydream about kids. Solomon is saying, man, remember, remember your creator. Remember him in the days of your youth before evil days come and the years draw near of which you'll say, I have no pleasure in them. You will get to that point. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because there are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut. You know what he's, you know what he's describing here? Somebody nearing the end of their life. And you know it. You're getting older and the doors are closing and the, the windows and the light's getting dimmer and the grinders used to hear all this noise and it was the noise of production and, and, and wealth and prosperity and, and it represented food and all this stuff is just it's closing down rapidly. Man, James is right. Your life is like a vapor. Here one minute, gone the next. He says, before all this happens, before you wake up and you're like, how did I get to, how did I get to be 100? <laughs> you know? People always told me, they're like, man, the years, when you get older, you know, it starts out and you think life is going fast, and then the older you get, it's just like, Phew. whoa. This is what he's describing here. The doors on the streets are shut when the sound of the grinding is low. One rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are brought low. They're afraid also of what is high and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms. The grasshopper drags itself along and the desire fails. Because man is going to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. You see this coming. He says, before you get to this point, man, when you're a child, cling to God, love him, get in tune with him. Parents, I ask this question, and man, I'm so guilty of this. What are we doing to teach our kids how to just fall madly in love, head over heels with God? We get to the teenage years and we're like, okay, now I'm going to start. I've got news for you. It's too late. Start when they're young and they're happy and they're free and they're walking along and they're like, our kids, I love the questions they ask. Just ask all kinds of questions, and they just get it. Kids get it. Man, are they in tune with God. Where does this tree come? That one's pretty benign, right? <laughs> then they get to the infamous one, where do babies come from? And then you're like, you got some explaining to do. But, like, you know, kids are just intuitive. They're, they're so intuitive, and they're so in tune with God. What are we doing, what are we doing to help that along and to coach them and to, and to teach them before the burdens of life press down on them? He goes on, he says, before the silver cord is snapped or the golden bowl is broken or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the cistern and the dust returns to earth as it was. He's talking about death. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the nails firmly, like nails firmly fixed, are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. You know what he's saying there? Like everything else in the world doesn't matter. What is our moral guide? What is our spiritual guide? What is the truth? How do you find that? Where do you look to find truth? Because there's so much knowledge out there. And it leads us into this realm of schizophrenia. We're constantly looking for the next best church, the next best answer, the next best worship. How do we, make, how do, we do this better? How do we do this? And we begin getting in the cycle of seeking righteousness to soothe our own souls. We're self, self-soothing. It's really a selfish Christianity. Solomon's like, Man, the words of the wise, listen. They're like goads. They're like nails firmly fixed at the collected sayings. They're given by him. They're given by one shepherd. My son, be aware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. 
the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. Isn't that amazing? The wisest guy on the planet, here's the advice. Fear God, keep his commandments. Wait a second. I want to know, like, you know, and we're, we're like digging, we're on this quest, and he comes back, and this is his summation. He sums it all up in this. Fear God, keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. You fear God. You fall in love with him. You fall madly in love with him. You keep his commandments. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. I told you guys about uh, Wycliffe Campbell last week. Uh, Wycliffe, 11 years old, DP and I have stood uh, on the very spot in the little Buffalo Creek where he drowned. Uh, it's within eyesight of the Campbell Mansion. Uh, I had read to you uh, that he was uh, he would memorize a couple verses a day. Um, he was in the process when that, when his dad Alexander Campbell went over to Scotland and England. Little Wycliffe at 11 years old, he talked to his mom about it. He wanted to surprise his dad. Alexander Campbell, and when he returned from that trip, Little Wycliffe was going to have the entire Proverbs memorized from cover to cover. He was going to have the whole book of Proverbs memorized. He was in, I think, chapter 11 or 12 at the time of his death. Had all those chapters memorized at 11 years old. It's incredible. What are we doing to teach and instruct our kids about God? I want to encourage you this week um, to just let so much of the stuff that doesn't matter in this life, just strip it, strip it down. Strip it away from your life. Ask yourself, is this serving to set my heart on God and to teach others to do likewise? If it's not, I recommend you cut it or at least pause it. Put it, put it on hold and go back to that. We have filled our lives. I said we have never been as busy as we've been in the history of mankind. We're busier now than we've ever been, and we accomplish far less now than we ever have in the history of man. We're accomplishing way less. I can't believe eight hours in a day blows by, and I'm like, what did I, what did I just do with eight hours? Eight hours. I feel so busy, and I got so little done. I need to start stripping all that stuff away that doesn't matter, and seek God. Teach our kids to do likewise. If there's anybody who has any prayer needs or anybody who's not yet taken that step to put Christ on a baptism, we invite you to do that as we stand and sing.